The America's Democrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to America's Democrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. This is America's Democrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. Charlie Peters remembers the New Deal. Things have gone off the rails since then, but he remains optimistic. Why? We have no choice, he says. Fred Rodondaro says he's not optimistic, but thinks Trump will be impeached. And Bill Press talks free college with Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Charlie Peters, an influential voice for the working class and for progressives, says he's optimistic about the American story and that Trump is one of the great wake-up calls in history for Democrats. We say hello to Charles Peters, who served in the West Virginia legislature. He helped manage JFK's West Virginia primary victory, helped found the Peace Corps, and founded the highly influential Washington Monthly magazine. He's also a prolific author in his latest book, We Do Our Part Toward a Fairer and More Equal America. Charlie Peters, thank you very much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Glad to be with you. And nice to have you with us as well. Clearly, you are not a fan of Donald Trump, but your book harkens back to the New Deal. So, in a sense, aren't you, too, advocating making America great again? Uh, He's making for making America great in some power sense. Uh, uh, The New Deal was for making America great in the the sense that we were all together uh, uh, and helping each other. Now, you suggest that Democrats have gone off the rails, partly because the coastal elites have emphasized too many social issues like gay rights, abortion, guns, and, and the environment. Should should they stop talking about those things to win 2018 and 2020 elections? I don't think they have to stop, uh, uh, change their position on those things. I, have to, I think they have to explain their position uh, and and. and Argue with the other side with more understanding of the uh, of the legitimate concerns of the other side, uh, and this they have uh, notably failed to do uh, on the uh, on ab- on, ab- on abortion, for instance. Uh, they uh, they uh, are not sensitive to the point that the the. Science now points to the early viability of the fetus, uh, and uh, uh, so that the people, the anti-abortion people, have a legitimate concern that that uh, we need to acknowledge, uh, just like we want the the people on the right to acknowledge the legitimacy of environmental science. Uh, we have to show we understand the other side and that we don't think the people uh, who have these other views, uh, like on guns, uh, uh, that they're, they're all a bunch of idiots, uh, because they aren't. And when we treat them like a bunch of idiots, uh, they, uh, they feel just as you would feel if somebody treated you like an idiot. Mm-hmm. You, would, you would not like them. And yeah, you absolutely. Them. Right, right. Now, your analysis is similar to that of Thomas Frank, who seems to blame the the Democrats' demise uh, actually on well-educated, wealthy liberals. So what is wrong with getting an Ivy League education if you can, making money honestly, and trying to help the less fortunate? Uh, There's nothing at all, uh, nothing wrong with any of those things as long as you you, you, uh, don't feel you're better than the next guy because you've done them. Mm -hmm. Now, certain... Certain working class white men in, in, in four states elected Donald Trump. Shouldn't they, and not liberals, be blamed for the disaster facing this country? <laughs> they, uh, well, I, I, don't th- I don't think we should think of them all as pure innocents. And they, they aren't. They, they have uh, 
many of them have been converted to to uh, very ugly feelings by a, a combination of of all the years of of coded racism of of uh, of propaganda from uh, Rush, the Rush Limbaugh's and Fox News is uh, uh, so, and and then now the Donald Trumps and Breitbart and Steve Bannon, uh, all of those, all of those they have brought out very ugly feelings on the part of many average Americans. Uh, so uh, they are. They, but what uh, my point is that liberals have been guilty in what's happened in the, in the success of of the Fox News and the Rush Limbaugh's because they have failed to reach out to the average American as the, as the Rush Limbaugh's and Fox News have succeeded in doing. We're speaking with Charles Peters, who's founder founder of the highly influential uh, Washington Monthly Magazine. Also, he's an author, and his latest book is We Do Our Part Toward a Fairer and More Equal America. Charlie, you come from coal country. How can yes. the few... Yeah, how can the few remaining miners be duped into thinking that Trump can bring back those jobs? I mean, isn't isn't it the case that a rational economy would not want those jobs back? Oh no, and 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 I I I I I, I am no friend of coal mining. Uh, I've seen it kill too many people and wreck too many lives and give those miners black lung and 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 despoil the environment of particularly of southern West Virginia. It's one of the great environmental tragedies of history. Uh, so so uh, I, that frankly, I hate coal mining. But I think anybody who has uh, uh, opposed uh, the coal mining and wanted to, had to, had to have uh, come up with a program to, that would create jobs where, uh, to, to fill the vacancy uh, uh, left by uh, the the disappearance of coal. Now, how much of the split in American politi- politics do you think is due to race? Oh, it, it's uh, it's always been a factor. Uh, the thing is, with Martin Luther King and the approach of Martin Luther King, the nonviolent approach, um, it was uh, things were. Uh, uh, getting so much better. There were so many other factors of um, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's wife, Eleanor, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the movies that uh, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, even the radio show Amos and Andy and the television show, they all had the effect of humanizing blacks. And so uh, lynching uh, plummeted. Uh, the, the legal rights of blacks greatly increased uh, from the Fair Employment Practices Commission during the war uh, to uh, Truman uh, desegregating the armed forces in 1948 to Brown versus Board uh, desegregating the schools in 1954, uh, then to the Civil Rights Act in uh, 1964 and 65. Uh, so those, the, this was uh, the, the greatest progress in history of, or <laughs> At least since Reconstruction, of of uh, in legal rights for uh, for blacks, uh, so it was a great time. Then, then came uh, the uh, the death of uh, the assassination of King, the race riots that, uh, and then a development in among in Black America of a of a of an angry. Uh, n- threat of violence of movement, uh, the, uh, the Black Panthers being an example, and uh, that scared the pants off of, 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 of the white Americans whose ki- King's approach had been uh, make, uh, moderating their, their racial feelings and, and, and getting them to accept integration. In 1960, um, I was bragging to Jack Kennedy about how rapidly West Virginia was integrating its schools, faster faster than many of the other states acting under the Brown versus Board decision. Uh, we were driving down to a, a, a college in West Virginia, West Virginia State, and I said, Senator, I want you to know that, that we're, 
at college is 50% white, 50% black, and everybody's getting along fine. Uh, so that was the way. Uh, I, I, I sponsored a human rights bill in the state legislature, and uh, there was no George Wallace that got up and to oppose it. It was, it it it, uh, it went through with relative ease. Uh, so the, the, it was just uh, uh, things were really getting a lot better, uh, and now uh, uh, because of these up factors I mentioned before, things have, and and the exacerbation of racial feelings of the coded racism, of which I think uh, Nixon and Ronald Reagan were guilty. Remember Ronald Reagan's welfare queen? Mm-hmm. That was coded racism. Uh, and, and Reagan uh, has gotten a free pass in history, but he was he was very guilty of that, and uh, as was Nixon, uh, and certainly Rush Limbaugh and Fox News, and Bill O'Reilly. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, it, you remain optimistic about the future, but I've got to ask you why, especially since so few young people want to enter public service. Oh, I'm 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 op, I'm optimistic because I think uh we have no choice. If we're if we if we want to make things better, uh uh young people have to wake up. And I saw signs that they were waking up. I saw signs in the Sanders campaign. Uh, I didn't agree with Bernie on everything, but Bernie was sublimely right about the one percent having too much. Uh, and uh, and the, a lot of young people got onto that. A lot of young people began to care. Uh, and uh, I think now that that, that Trump has one, been one of the great wake-up calls of history for. For liberal Democrats, uh, yeah, you better get get out there and uh, and and vote. You better get out there and work in the Democratic Party, and you better start running for your office and helping other people, good people, run for office. If if you don't do that, if you leave that to the Republicans, if you leave that to the bad guys, if you leave that to the Koch brothers, uh, we're going to go on losing. You want to start winning, and you want to start winning for the good causes we believe in. Amen. Charles Peters, editor, political theorist, founder of the highly influential Washington Monthly Magazine. Of course, he is an author as well, and his latest book is We Do Our Part Toward a Fairer and More Equal America. Charlie, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it and look forward to having you back again soon. It was a pleasure. Thank you. You're quite welcome. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This Social Security measure. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing or one time in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America. Whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Regular commentator Fred Rodondaro is most definitely not very optimistic. But he does predict that if 5 to 10 percent of Trump's core support turns against him, Mitch McConnell and his ilk will ask the president to resign. 
More on that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Poor John Stomp, the preening, silver-haired CEO of Wells Fargo, sat self-assuredly atop the pecking order of the financial establishment, and he was hailed as a paragon of big banker virtue until he suddenly fell off his lofty perch. It turns out that being a paragon of big banker virtue is not at all the same as being a virtuous human being. Banker elites don't get paid the big bucks by doing what's right, but by doing what's most profitable. And that means cutting corners on ethics, common decency, and the golden rule. Stumpf didn't just cut corners, he crashed through them, devising a business plan that effectively encouraged Wells Fargo branches to steal from millions of their poorest and most easily deceived customers. The courtly chief executive coldly fostered a high-pressure sales culture, pushing elderly pensioners, non-English-speaking workers, and other vulnerable depositors into accounts they didn't understand or need, extracting high fees for the bank. One shameful and illegal profit-boosting ploy was having bank employees secretly set up fake high-fee accounts for some two million customers without their knowledge, much less their consent. Running such rackets for more than a decade, Wells Fargo prospered and the chief amassed a fabulous personal fortune. Then, as the scandal went public last year, the paragon of virtue tried to save himself by firing 5,300 lower-level employees. But it wasn't enough. Stumpf was shoved out and forced to surrender $41 million in stock awards he had stashed away. This is Jim Hightower saying, But don't weep for poor John. He grabbed $83 million in stock payments on his way out last year, and he still holds another $147 million in Wells Fargo stock. It's said that virtue is its own reward, but big banker virtue is rewarded in cash. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Fred Rodondaro says Donald Trump is the most anti-American president we've ever had a selfish farce who plays coal miners and others for dummies. And we say hello to Fred Rodondaro, regular commentator here on AmericasDemocrats.org and, of course, chair of Catholics in Alliance for the Common Good. Fred, as always, thanks for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you, Jim. Good to be here, even even in these circumstances. Yeah, (laughs) right. And these circumstances are exactly what we're going to talk about today. Um, So now that Donald Trump has proved beyond a doubt that he is everything we all thought he was is there any reason at all to be optimistic no uh except that uh trump's ratings keep falling uh they're now 38 40 percent but um if trump gets impeached uh we can't forget that uh right winger mike pence is going to be uh, right behind them. Uh, right-winger Paul Ryan is going to be right behind them. Uh, right-winger uh, Mitch McConnell, Rex Tillerson, they're going to be right there. Uh, we have uh, a right-wing government, and um, it's going to be uh, to our disadvantage uh, if we can survive these next two years. Um, I, I, uh, I think uh, Trump's going to be impeached. I, I do. Um, Would it be better if he's not impeached, but he continues with his antics and it ends up that everything turns in 2018? Wouldn't that be the, actually the better scenario? Yes, it would be the better scenario uh, because uh, then the Republicans would uh, come to their senses. Republicans right now, uh, people like Mitch McConnell, Paul Ryan, uh, they tolerate Trump. They know that he will give them everything they want. 
they know that if they turn against them right now, 38, 40 uh, percent of Republicans and, ni- and 83 uh, percent in the in the primaries will uh, will uh, uh, tolerate Trump and will uh, turn against them in the Demo- in, excuse me in the Republican primaries. So they're putting their long lived uh, fantasies of a no tax for the for the wealthy, no regulation uh, in Trump hands, and they're basking in the glory of Trump being a an anti American. He is the most anti American president we've ever had. Mm-hmm. You know, it, every time he does something bizarre, the media call it a distraction. And it's arguable about what the distraction is from. But do you think the resistance should stop complaining about things like Ivanka's White House office and, and perhaps keep talking instead about the economy and national security and things that actually matter? Yes, I do. Uh, Trump's most recent... Uh, 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 Berlusconi in Italy has been uh, Trump's most recent uh, advocate, uh, excuse me, uh, similarity. And, uh, um, and, um, and Italian newspapers uh, considered Berlusconi for his eccentricities. They continued to uh, talk about his 16, 17-year-old mistresses, uh, and they didn't talk about the economy. You know, Berlusconi was a entertainer, as Trump is. Trump is right now uh, entertaining the American public, including including his base. He is now. I I just saw him on TV today. He is now talking about how he's going to bring jobs back, how he is going to. regulations and with that uh with that he he will not uh he will not let down his um his uh base because he is constantly saying i am going to bring jobs back i'm going to i'm going to reduce the job killing regulations and they won't notice they won't notice jim that no jobs are being brought back. You know, I come from the coal country, and my father was a coal miner, and I remember the last day he worked in the mines, and a flood broke through, and 12 miners drowned in that flood. Luckily, my father wasn't one of them, but coal miners have been disastrously misled through 50 years, 60 years of American uh, coal mining history. Trump is right now leading coal miners through another uh, disaster. Uh, Trump is right now saying, I will bring your coal mining jobs back. That is a farce. That is a selfish farce. He is misleading. He is playing for dunces, coal miners, and with those at the at the vanguard, he is welcoming. He is uh, he is uh, playing uh, coal miners for for for, excuse me for uh, chumps, and he is also playing. working men and women for for chumps. Who who do you think is Trump's biggest enemy? Democrats, the federal courts, or perhaps the Freedom Caucus? The federal courts. Because the federal courts are so often in the position, whether they're Republican or Democrat, whether they're Republican or Democrat, the federal courts are so often in the position of uh, of uh, defending the law, the federal uh, the, Trump's biggest allies 
um, are the 38, 40 percent of uh, his um, his um, uh, uh, core support uh, who will not deviate from their loyalty to Trump. They have been deceived by the Republicans. They have been abandoned by the Democrats. Trump is their last ally and their last love. And they are blind to Trump hypocrisy and, and mistrust. And they are blind to his, uh, his, uh, uh, what is the word, his disloyalty and his cruelty, his cruelty. And we're speaking with Fred Rodondaro, regular commentator here on americasdemocrats.org, of course, chair of Catholics and Alliance for the Common Good. You know, it, it is somewhat historically very jarring for people on the left to be demanding tough action against Russia. So what should the progressive response be to the Russian interference in our electoral process? Uh, let the uh, FBI play out its uh, investigation, play for federal laws that, with the cooperation of some Republicans, and some Republicans, uh, I mean, uh, obviously John McCain, Lindsey Graham, their uh, uh, objection to uh, Russian interference in our elections. You know what's been... Uh, hypocritical uh, in this election in the uh, in FBI investigations has been the reluctance of most Republicans to see what is before their eyes. There is no way that Trump and his allies, Trump establishment, can be this viciously connected with with the Russians, with coincidence, and then forget to mention it. There is no way that um, that can happen. And yet, most Republicans, most Republicans, um, ignore it. Is the Trump administration in crisis, or is it too early to say that? It is in crisis. Um, uh, it's, it's not too early to say. Uh, it is in crises. The Trump administration will um, be in further crises when uh, Defense Secretary Mathis uh, or the National Security Advisor uh, or uh, one other a uh, respected uh, member of the cabinet says, this is it. I'm, I'm tired of propping up this government. I'm tired of supporting his lies. This is it. And when that occurs, if 5% or 10% of the Trump core support uh, turns against him, turns against him, then uh, you'll see the Republican leaders, uh, people such as Mitch McConnell, uh, Paul Ryan, uh, suddenly turn and say, we demand, we demand an investigation. They will go like uh, Barry Goldwater and you, Scott, did uh, some 50 years ago to um, – uh, 40 years ago, to uh, Richard Nixon and say, for the good of the country, we demand that you resign. Mm -hmm. H has he boxed him into, boxed himself rather, I into utter failure by promising to fix things in Washington, by ignore ignoring the establishment, and then purposely antagonizing the people he needs to get things done? Yeah, I think you're right, Jim. Uh, uh, he has um, boxed himself in. He's not only he knows he's smart enough to know that he cannot fix the jobs for for blue collar Americans. Uh, he knows that he diverts uh, attention to um, uh, the uh, Muslims, uh, the Muslims from the six countries to uh, see what they are 
uh, promising, uh, we'll see what they are uh, promising to do uh, uh, to the Muslims for the six countries. So he's exciting fear. Okay, uh, Jim, I have a job for blue collar America. He will not, he will not, uh, he is not taking credit uh, for uh, every job, but he is damn well, uh, he is damn well uh, uh, seeking credit for 99% of the jobs. And he's not going to get credit for all of the jobs. Uh, but he is seeking credit for 99% of them. And there's going to come a time when uh, you, don't, you don't see these uh, blue-collar workers uh, saying, well, give them time. Uh, you don't see these blue-collar workers say, well, uh, give them time and we'll see. Uh, he is... Uh, now, now he is uh, um, uh, advocating uh, a uh, um, a health care bill, uh, which was de de defeated, that would eliminate uh, health care for 24 million workers, and for the 400 richest Americans, it would give them seven million dollar tax cuts. Now, you can't get too far beyond uh, a $7 million tax cut and say you're a populist. You can't get too far beyond a $180,000 tax cut and say for the 1% and say you're a populist. Mm-hmm. Now, before we let you go, do you, do you think progressives, perhaps, Fred, need a rating system of the most serious of Trump's crazy statements and ideas just so that we focus only on a few big ones? Because how can you possibly fight every single thing with any energy or unity? Uh, you know, Jim, you, you may have hit you may have hit a point, uh, hit a point. Uh, you can't uh, you can't uh, do that. Uh, you can't just do that. Um, uh, I, I, um, um, uh, I responding to a, um, uh, fellow, uh, uh, to a fellow, uh, uh, of my, uh, uh, of my, uh, uh, acquaintance in Luzerne County said, well, tell me 10 Trump lies. Well, I, I looked up and there were hundreds of lies. Uh, you've got it right. You've, you've got it right. Um, the understanding of lies in Trump's world um, is uh, grass is grossly uh, coming to pass, is grossly uh, coming to um, uh, haunt him. Uh, the uh, the most outrageous lie is uh, uh, the fact that Trump, excuse me, the fact that uh, Obama wiretapped him. Right. Yeah, uh, it's just, I mean, it's it's astounding, all of the different things he says. So we do, we need to yeah. keep a log, and we have to pick and choose which ones we really want to, want to hone in on. <laughs> uh, just crazy times. I'm going to tweet that and declare it's mine. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Fred Rodendaro, regular commentator here on America's Democrats.org, chair of Catholics in Alliance for the Common Good. Fred, thank you so much, as always, for your time today with us. We look forward to having you back again soon. Thank you. You're welcome. And this is America's Democrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. <laughs> We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats.
And now Bill Press talks with Washington State Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal. So pleased to welcome to the studio for the first time Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal from Washington's 7th Congressional District. Now, one of the most exciting new ideas to come out of the primary last year was from Bernie Sanders, whom I endorsed. Uh, for so did I, by the way. <laughs> there you, go. Uh, you two are going to get along really well. I think. This is four this is years of public college free for students in America. You and the senator now have introduced that legislation. We have. It was, yeah. a, it was a great honor to work with him on it. It was one of my campaign pledges. It was one of the things I ran on. Um, look, I... Why is it so important? Here's why it's important. We used to be a country that invested in education, K-12 education, but also higher education. Just a few decades ago, City University of New York was providing free tuition. The University of California system, free tuition. We invested in the GI Bill. We sent millions of people to college who had never, who were the first in their families to go to college. We invested in Pell Grants, which used to cover 70% of a public university uh, education. We were first in the world for graduating people out of higher education. Today, we're 11th in the world. Today, 82% of students who go to public universities and colleges uh, are come out with student loans. And the loans range anywhere from 30,000 to 100,000. And so this is not a time anymore where a high school diploma is enough. We, We know that in this increasingly competitive world, you have to have that higher education. And it it could be, doesn't have to be a four-year, could be a two-year, could be trades, vocational opportunities. Um, and so th- what we're trying to do is say, you know what, we understand that it is not right that we say to kids, hey, go out there, study hard, you know, get an education. But they have to make the choice of whether they want to spend um, all this money and be $100,000 in debt at the end or $50,000 in debt with interest rates uh, on student loans that now we are we have one point three trillion dollars in student loan debt that 's more than the credit card debt wow. that we have really it yeah. is it is and um you know when I started working on this during the campaign well actually I worked on it during the state Senate when I was in the state Senate, I had a bill to offer free community college mm-hmm. um for everybody uh-huh. incredibly popular didn't pe- you know we put it out as a talking point really we knew it wasn't going to pass in the first year and then I ended up coming to Congress but um what I heard from people is this despair, and honestly, I think it's part of what came through in the election. People know that their next generation is not even as well off as they were. And this issue of college debt is not just about young people anymore, it's also about parents and grandparents. The fastest growing segment of people that have college debt now is older people because they are taking on the debt of their kids and their grandkids. So this is Uh a really interesting phenomenon. But So what we're saying in this bill is if we invest in higher education for our kids, um, for our young, for young people, for our next generation, that they will come back, be able to get better jobs, be able to take care of their families, and be able to contribute to their communities and the economy. I think in the end, it's an economic boost because you have more people in jobs, earning more money, and ultimately contributing back. But it's also about respect and, and dignity. And, you know, if you're, if you're a lefty like me, you also believe it's the right thing to do. It's the moral yeah. thing to do. But it's also good for the economy. So our bill says let's incentivize states to invest again in higher education. What's happened is states have decreased their investments in higher education. By 2020, 2022, there are some states in the country that will no longer put any money into higher education. So our bill says, let's create a federal-state partnership. Two-thirds of the dollars will be provided by the federal government and a third by the states. And that will allow for families earning up to $125,000. This was the compromise that was agreed upon in the Democratic platform Mm -hmm, last year. mm -hmm. Up to $125,000 will get free college tuition and and free fees. Um, And this would cover about 80 80 to 82 percent of all of the young people who go to public universities and colleges. If you go to a community college, you're free no matter what income level you are. So that's one big part of the bill. 
second part of the bill takes on the issue of uh, interest rates. It's ridiculous that the federal government is profiting from student loan debt. We're, we're making a lot of money off of this. So we're saying let's cut the interest rates in half. It should be affordable. If you do need to take on debt, it should be affordable. And if you're an existing borrower, which is you know so many people across the country, we right. will allow you to refinance your debt, your student loan debt, just like you do with a house, yeah. you know, a mortgage, right. whatever, so you're not locked your in. car, right. so you're not locked in, and you get to do it at that lower rate. We also triple the investments in TRIO and work-study programs because those targeted programs really help benefit first in the family to, to go to college, low-income folks, folks of color who we know are disproportionately burdened in our system right now. Very excited about the bill. It has gotten so much um, excitement across the country. The legislation is just the first piece. I'm an organizer my whole life. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is now start to organize around the country on college campuses and really start to put the pressure on people in, in Congress to support the bill on both sides of the aisle. This is not a partisan issue. Tennessee provided free community college through their Tennessee Promise. There's states across the country that recognize that we're not training people up. So, you know, we we can't have the workforce we need to have. This is what I think is so interesting about this is I think that Democrats have finally realized how to talk to people and explain to them that the government can help you. The yeah, government can right. work for you because there's been so it's been so long that you know, Republicans are sort of like, the government is broken, the government can't do this, the government can't do that. And, like, we're finally getting to the point, like, you as a citizen deserve health care. The government can deliver that to you and not completely screw you over. You as a citizen deserve to go to college and get a higher education and also not have, you know, yeah. a yeah. giant loan that hangs over your head for your most of your adult life. Yeah. That it's these big. are things that only the government can do. Yeah, and I, I think, think that they, right. they, they, the voice is there now. It's really important and really exciting to see. The thing that bothered me during the primary about what the whole discussion of this, uh, at, that every time uh, Bernie talked about it, we would hear from the Hillary people, oh, you can't do this. We, we can't do this. <laughs> I said, what do you mean we can't do this? We're <laughs> Americans, right? You know, and if we can, Bernie used to say that if we can fund K through 12, why do we say... That's as much as we can do, right? And just throw in the uh, towel. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's a bread and butter issue because having uh, two kids in high school and another one who's younger, <laughs> I can have two kids in college. So, yeah. um, and it, honestly, about five to seven years ago, I, I was openly saying, I don't know why, why the parties aren't talking about this yeah. issue because mm. everyone that I'm talking to and my friends and colleagues are talking about this issue. So it's something that certainly resonates where it affects everyday Americans, right. et cetera. The uh, question. How do you pay for it? Yeah. So the way you pay for it, well, it's not in the bill. Okay. Um, this is a separate bill that was introduced by Keith Ellison. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially our proposal is that you pay for it through a small tax on Wall Street speculation. Mm -hmm. And that would definitely cover it. But I'll tell you something. You know, people always say, oh, you know, how do you, how do so you pay for it? So per transaction, is that it? Financial transactions Financial tax. Financial transaction. Correct. Tax. Right. Um, my belief is not is that you know if you look at our budget and you look at what the Republicans proposed a trillion dollars in tax cuts on health care, it's not that we aren't going to spend this money. We are going to spend the money. The question is how do we spend it? Do we spend it on tax cuts for the wealthiest, or do we spend it on education, which benefits everybody across the country? Um, and so our proposal is the financial transactions tax. There's all kinds of ways you could fund this if you, you know, I mean, you, you look at the budget. There's many, many places where you could make choices. And so to me, the real question when people say, how do you fund it, is what's your priority? If you have a priority to invest in education that is going to benefit everybody in this country, then we can find a way to fund it. The other thing I say to people is, it's not like we haven't done this before. I mean, we, we used to provide um, education and we used to cover 70% of the costs of public education. So it was affordable. My husband, um, you know, his dad died when he was six, and so he went to college on survivor benefits from Social Security. His brother moved all the way out to California so that he could get an education because there was no other way that they could get it at the time. So we have had this system in place where we have provided for people to go to college. We should be able to do it again. 
And um, not to mention that every other major developed country in the world provides public education. People are moving to other countries to get education now because it's so unaffordable in the United States. That's not how it should be. And it is the right thing to do, Bill. But it's also the reason that we got a lot of businesses on board with higher education investments in the state. You know, Washington State, when I was in the state Senate, was one of the states that actually put enough money into higher education uh, put enough more money into higher education that we dropped the cost of tuition by 5%. And that's not a lot, but it was something. And the reason we got that is because we are going to have a 60% gap in applicants capable of filling our jobs by the year 2020. We're not graduating enough people. And we're getting people from other states and from other countries to fill those jobs. We should be training Americans to do those jobs. We should be investing in our next generation. And this is what they're discovering really in the Silicon Valley, right? I mean, with the, uh, yeah. what the H-1B? H-1B visas. visas. Yeah. Yeah. H-1B yeah. visas, yeah. right? Yeah, H-1Bs. Yeah, no, there, and there are a lot of, uh, I was talking to uh, Governor McCullough from Virginia. They're, I mean, they're offering some some great starting jobs in tech and but they can't fill them, can't and now they're providing them. incentives so that they can fill them, and it's and and they're great jobs, especially coming out of college uh, if you're trained for them. Right, if yeah. you're trained for them, no, and think, that's true in the trades too. By the way, yeah. I mean it's yeah. tech, but it's also the reason there's support in in red America and rural America as well, <laughs> is because, look. We have an aging workforce. If we did ever do the smart thing and invest in infrastructure, Mm -hmm. um, we need a whole new generation of workers to fill those trades jobs. That's something that's very popular in rural America. I just think it's one of the most exciting ideas, uh, most important ideas out there right now. So congratulations to you. you for being in the leadership of this. Um, Counting on you and Bernie to deliver. (laughs) We're working on it. We'll do whatever we can. (laughs) That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Charlie Peters, Fred Ronondaro, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For AmericasDemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.